Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our discussion of classifying forms of matter and identifying characteristics of chemical change. So those are the two pieces that we hope to get out of this lecture. One of the terms that we want to make sure that we distinguish between that we have not yet would be the difference between an element and a compound. An element would be the simplest form of matter that has a unique set of properties. These are the things that we can identify on the periodic table. Elements have atoms of all the same kind. A compound, while still a pure substance that has all most basic units the same as all others, is going to have two or more elements chemically combined in a fixed proportion. So unlike a mixture, where you're going to have things that could still be separate and retain their properties, a compound, the parts of it are joined together chemically in a fixed ratio. So water, as an example, has two hydrogens bonded for every one oxygen atom. So there are at least two or more different types of atoms making up that compound. One type of uh, molecule or particle that we can use for that is called a molecule. When we look at the compounds that are formed co and compare them to the elements that make them up, they're going to have different sets of properties. For example, sodium chloride is made from a combination or reaction between sodium and chlorine elements. Sodium is a highly reactive metal that is so reactive we can't store it in air or it would react with the oxygen and water vapor. Chlorine is a very fairly toxic chemical we use as a disinfectant and it helps kill harmful organisms in swimming pools. So two very reactive, fairly toxic chemicals. When they react to combine sodium chloride, one unit each of a sodium atom and a chlorine atom, they are a fairly innocuous substance that is safe to handle that we actually use to season and preserve food. So characteristics of sodium chloride, very different than the individual elements that make it up. Now what makes compounds unique that kind of helps us transition into chemical change is that to break them apart, we have to go through a chemical change. When I break down a compound, I have to use chemical means to do so. Elements, because they are the simplest substances that exist, you can't break an element down any further. Now the mixture separation techniques we talked about, like distillation, crystallization, filtration, you could separate those substances because they were separate individual compounds or substances. If it's chemically combined, you have to use different types of methods that actually cause reactions to break it apart. As a comparison point, when you boil water, which is a physical change, all you're doing is separating the water molecules into a different state. The parts that you see bubbling out of that is water vapor. They're still H2O molecules. If I was going to chemically break it apart into its component, oxygen and hydrogen, I would have to use some different means to do so. So what does that look like when I go through that type of a chemical change? Well, the biggest difference compared to physical change is I get new substances at the end. Once the change occurs, the chemical makeup or composition of the products, the outcome, is different than what I started with. So here we see our example of transitioning from a liquid to a gas state for water. Still the same compound, not a chemical change. It's physical. A chemical change, if I would apply electricity instead of heat, I can actually cause the oxygen and hydrogen atoms to break apart. Here, I have new substances in a different arrangement than what the water compound was to start.
composition or makeup is different from beginning to end. So how do we know if a chemical change has happened? We can look at and describe chemical properties. In order to measure these properties, you would have to actually put it through the chemical change. So we said physical properties, you don't have to change it to measure it. Chemical properties, you would have to cause the chemical change to occur to observe that outcome. So think about iron, we have a metal. It rusts, the ability to rust is a chemical property. We would have to actually test to see if the iron is able to rust in a combination with oxygen in order to determine the ability to do that. So to measure these properties, we typically have to change the actual outcome. How do we know if a chemical change has occurred? There are some pretty standard things to look for. First, listing as transfer of energy, we might see that in the form of heat or light or sound. Remember our flaming dragon demonstration from the beginning of the year? We heard the whistling and popping, and we saw that release of light. You might get a change in color. If the color changes, you have a new substance. Color would be a physical property, but if the properties are different, a color change could tell you you have something different than what you started with. Production of a gas. If we get a new substance, it may not be in the same state of matter as the original substances it was produced from. Make sure though, this is not like a boiling. This is not a simple state change. Lastly, we might see production of a precipitate. A solid can form by combining two different solutions, remember homogeneous uh, mixtures, and if you get a solid form that's a new substance, that's a new state of matter than what we had before. The only way to be sure of this though, especially for three and four, is to have some way to test the substance and identify its chemical makeup to confirm it is indeed a new substance. As you finish up, please make sure that you do any of the right-hand questions or summaries. The last page of the notes we will save for a later date. This will help us make sure that we can explain the demonstrations you're going to see in the near future.